Thank you for joining our Facebook Live interview with Dr. Robin Hathaway, missions professor at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri, and 2022 presidential nominee. More than 65 questions have been submitted by Southern Baptists from across the country to ask our nominees. Tonight, hear a seminary professor's views on COVID mandates, CRT, clergy abuse, non-disclosure agreements, and much more. I'm Bobby Gilstrap, and joining me tonight to discuss these topics and more is our special guest, Robin Hathaway. <music> Robin, good to have you tonight. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, we want to jump right into our interview with what we're calling our rapid fire round. And these are 10 questions, which we want to ask you to simply respond to with anywhere from one, maybe as many as four uh, words, but nothing more. So rapid fire, we're going to shoot them off and we want you to just respond uh, kind of off the cuff as quickly as possible. So uh, let's get started with that. Our first one is a, an easy one for you. Uh, we want to ask you to tell us one book that you'd recommend all Southern Baptists read. Well, that's kind of a softball question. So I'd recommend my book, Survey of World Missions. <laughs> that was uh, more than four words, but you got away with it because you, you, had, you had a prop there. Okay, question right. number two. In four words or less, describe your soteriology. I would be a decisionist. I am not reformed, but... Uh, I, I believe. Okay. No, that, that's sufficient. Okay. Number three, should the SBC implement an independent trustee training program for completion before trustees serve? Yes, I'd be in favor of that. Okay. Number four, should the SBC executive committee find a way to implement remote annual meeting attendance and voting? No. Number five, if there is a runoff in this year's SBC presidential ballot and you were to be eliminated, would you throw your support behind Tom Askell or Bart Barber? After I hear the nomination speeches. Okay, <laughs> make a decision then. Number six, if you lose the presidential race, will you stay SBC? Absolutely. Okay, number seven. Are you supportive of SBC entity presidents endorsing SBC office nominees? No. Should SBC entities sponsor or host campaign events? No. What percentage does your church give through the cooperative program? 1.05%. All right. And finally, what percentage does your church give through your local association? 1%. All right, very good. Well, that gets us through our rapid fire round. Some of those we may come back to as we discuss, uh, and there may be something that you want to go back to one of those questions to, to discuss further as we go. But let's jump right into our uh, topics as we begin. Uh, the last two years has brought about many challenges with COVID, uh, the COVID virus, lockdown and vaccine mandates, and a whole lot more over these past couple of years. Since you are the only presidential nominee that has served with our International Mission Board, I think many would be interested to know, do you support the vaccine mandate imposed by the IMB, and then why or why not? <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect that question. Um, I, 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 Paul Chitwood has given a, a rationale for that. Uh, in fact, I was at a meeting with all the six seminary uh, professors of missions, uh, and we had a meeting with the IMB staff, and that question was actually asked uh, by uh, one of the professors. And they said that they made that decision for their overseas missionaries to facilitate visas and uh, just the fact that when you've got 3,700 plus uh, personnel overseas, uh, to try to get people to countries where you don't have to have a vaccine uh, was unmanageable. So I'll accept his uh, explanation on that. Yeah. Okay, so you're supportive of their, their uh, stand on that based on his explanation? Yes. 
Very, very good. Uh, do us a favor before we jump too far into this. Uh, I did not intentionally uh, introduce you and your background. Uh, I'd like for you to take just a moment to briefly introduce yourself and help Southern Baptists know kind of who Robin Hathaway is. Okay. So I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. I graduated from high school there, second grade through the end of high school. And so I'm a Southern Oil fan. Um, you'll have to forgive me those of you in the Atlanta area. Uh, and then I, I moved uh, to Memphis. My family moved there when I graduated from high school. So I went to the University of Memphis. Uh, my parents joined Bellevue Baptist Church. So I was uh, ordained by Adrian Rogers at Bellevue Baptist Church. Uh, I went into the Air Force after college. I was in ROTC and I, I was stationed uh, in Florida, Texas, Alaska and Nevada. My first job in the, in the ministry was the youth director at King Salmon Baptist Mission for HM, the old HMB uh, missions program, Don Rollins. And uh, that's where God called me to preach when I was uh, preaching at the base chapel uh, every Sunday. Um, and so then I served as, a, as the uh, youth director for uh, the home mission board missionary. And then uh, I resigned my commission uh, to go to seminary. God called me to preach while I was up in Alaska. So uh, because the Southern Baptist seminaries in the 70s weren't as conservative as they needed to be, I went to Dallas Seminary for two years. And uh, my wife and I both grew up Southern Baptist. And so I decided uh, that I would go to Southwestern. So I did my third year at Southwestern. Uh, God did not call me to missions when I was at Southwestern. It, uh, my wife and I decided to take a church in the West. My wife, although she's from Texas, she moved to Phoenix when she was 16. My parents moved out to Los Angeles, and so I, I took a pastorate. I wanted to go pastor in the Pioneer area, Southern Baptist, so I pastored in Los Angeles County, Monterey Park. Did that for four years, and uh, God called us at Glorietta Baptist uh, Camp to go to uh, Mission Field. So we went to Tanzania uh, in 1984 as a church planner. Um, we had our, our third child. Well, actually, we lost a child in Kenya. She's still, she's buried there. Our fourth child was born mentally handicapped. So we came back for two years. I pastored in Phoenix again church uh, that ran about 420 and uh, a weekly wor uh, worship service. And, uh, but then the doctor said, you know, it's okay. Doesn't matter how you're going to raise this child. You can raise her in the States or overseas. So uh, we went back to the mission field, went to North Africa. Uh, we were there uh, for several years, went to Nairobi for five years. Then the IMB had the great idea to send a missionary from Africa to lead all the missionaries in Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. So uh, you know how mission boards uh, reorganize. You know they don't always think all these things through. So, uh, but we had a great time. Had seven years, six and a half years in South America. And um, when our our daughter got to be about the age of fifteen, we felt like she needed a special ed. So I became the professor of missions at Midwestern Seminary. So I did 18 years with the IMB, 18 years teaching as a professor of missions, and then a six years total pastor. Um, well, I know this is a bit of a long answer, and I promised you I wouldn't ramble, but uh, when I was at Midwestern, I was interim president. Uh, I spent eight months as the interim CFO, admin VP, and then uh, three years as dean of students. And, uh, but of course my joy is teaching missions and uh, I became the senior professor of missions and we decided to, I think I was kind of tired of the winters in Kansas City. So we decided to move to Oceanside, California. We've been there one year now or almost a year. And uh, really our daughter and grandchildren are out there. That was the real reason that we went that way. But uh, the weather's pretty good too. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, and most could understand why you'd take uh, the California weather over 
the Kansas City weather for sure uh, right. at that point. Right. Well, look, uh, I want you to uh, tell us just a little bit uh, about your book because your your book came out not too, too long ago. And uh, right. you did say that's the one that you think all Southern Baptists should read. Obviously, you're biased, but uh, right. what, what are some specific reasons why you think uh, that book is valuable? Why was it important for you to write it? And why do you think it's important for us to read it? Yeah. So it was my first book. I have a second book. That, this book came out in 2020, and then I had one that came out in 2021, but it's more uh, technical about Islam and folk Islam. But this book, I wrote this so that a, sem a college student, seminary student, a doctoral student, a layman, a uh, somebody who is on a, the missions committee of a local church, that anyone could pick it up and learn what missiology is about and put enough stories from our past in there uh, to make it interesting. And I think it's, it's a good Southern Baptist textbook, although there's lots of people using it that aren't Southern Baptist. And so I have a chapter on theology. I have a chapter on the scripture, uh, how it ties in with missions as well as contextualization. Uh, so, uh, like you said, I, I have to say I'm biased, but I uh, wish all Southern Baptists would, uh, would would take a look at it. It it would educate them on how we do our cooperative missions, and yeah, I no, try to and I try to emphasize home missions, NAM missions as much as international missions. Yeah, that's good. Well, and uh, that is something that we find lacking in many of our churches. Even a lot of our pastors don't have a full grasp of that. So I did notice we'll we'll put a link to that book down in the video description for people so people can easily find it uh, right. down there. And uh, just a little, uh, I'll give you a little side promo just because it happened when I looked this up today. Uh, to, to get the link to put in the video description. I noticed that Amazon right now has your book at 22% off. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> well, a ad for you. Yeah, 22% it be good off. Or bad. It, maybe it means it's not selling. They want to get rid of it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But anyway, it's 22% it's off. Uh, you also have put up a website that has some information on it. People can find that. Uh, we'll put the link to that in the description as well. But it's robindalehadaway.com. And we will put that in the link below. All right, let's jump on into the rest of our questions. Um, as a seminary professor, uh, you're the only one that has the perspective among our three candidates of, of being one employed by an entity. So how, how do you feel about our SBC entities using non-disclosure agreements for those who work for them or those who are leaving? Yeah. Well, the other two candidates both have PhDs, and so um, th they also understand kind of how the seminaries work. Um, yeah, I, I listened to the other two candidates' responses on these. Um, I understand non-disclosure agreements because uh, when I was interim president, um, I did terminate someone um, who was a vice president. and. Um, I think that we we do have to use. So I'll just be honest with you. We, I think that um, when, when you're dealing with the entity, and I know churches have these also sometimes. If a pastor's given a package, if he'll, you know, leave, um, and and I think that it it just resolves uh, potential issues that might come up because some of these packages can be generous. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, so Milton Ferguson, when he was president of Midwestern, and he was uh, no friend of the conservatives. Um, and he had many moderate to liberal professors who were um, on the uh, payroll of Midwestern. Uh, the, and the trustees gave him one of these agreements and it was very generous so that he would, and of course he's now, he's passed away. So um, I would just say that they, they were generous to him. And then we were able to get Dr. Coppinger uh, as the president. Uh, but I think without one of those agreements, um, 
uh, you can't really, um, trustees can't really deal with um, at least someone that's in administration. Uh, so well, let me let me ask you this, because I, I, think, I think here's the pushback uh, yeah. for a lot of folks. I don't think the pushback yeah. is as much over the financial. Uh, if someone is being released, especially from a high level uh, entity position, uh, there, there probably needs to be some type of a, a package of some sort that's put together. Uh, and that doesn't need to be exorbitant, obviously. I mean, that's a, an, an unusually high uh, place of leadership, that kind of a role. So that would be expected. But I think the pushback more than anything comes that most of those uh, NDAs are much more of a blanket uh, covering everything rather than just the finances. And the concern is, is that when there is wrongdoing, when there is a separation, whether it be, uh, in some cases, there's been even some accusations of some unlawful things being done, and an individual either leaves of their own accord or they're, they're terminated, and they're forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement or their retirement's withheld or their uh, benefits package withheld or their insurance is withheld for a time or whatever. There's all kinds of pieces of leverage that are very significant to a, a family, especially a younger uh, individual and family. Uh, well, actually, it's older too, I guess, uh, either way. So I think that's where I hear more pushback is on these non-disclosure agreements stifling the ability for anybody to say, but look, this is not right at this entity. This is wrong. This money is not being spent properly. This kind of behavior is not proper, uh, whatever. Uh, so how, how would you respond to that part of what's being covered up through NDAs? Well, I can only respond to what, what we did at Midwestern. And I, I think that now, somebody's retirement is tied up in Godstone and that's vested. So I don't think anyone could lose that. Uh, generally speaking, um, maybe medical benefits are given for two months to three months to six months or even a year. Um, I, I, I just have to say, Bobby, I, I just think that if they do serve a purpose. Now, if, if there's wrongdoing, that's a whole other problem. And mm -hmm. there are ways to go about that, um, contacting trustees. Um, usually, though, the trustees are involved in these non-disclosure agreements. So I would just say okay. um, I, I think it's wise to have them. Okay. Well, let me, let me push one more time, and I don't want to belabor this because we've got a lot of other questions that we yeah. want to talk about. But yeah, one of your professors... You push back on bar on a couple of things, too, so that's okay. Yeah, well, and, and it's okay. Uh, uh, but, but I'll push back on you maybe different than him. Uh, <laughs> but being a professor at Midwestern, Midwestern has been, uh, you know, the, the site of some controversy, but Southern actually became one of the most heated related to the non-disclosure agreements sometime back, and Southwestern. Uh, we had the situation with uh, uh, Bobby... Lopez, I just drew a blank, with Bobby Lopez at Southwestern, who was released, and they wanted him to sign a non-disclosure agreement, he refused, and then Russell Fuller at Southern Seminary, yeah. uh, both of them making accusations of wrongdoing, et cetera, et cetera, I don't need to go into all the details yeah. of those, but uh, those have caught the attention of a lot of people, because they just said, I'm unwilling to sign it, and I'm not willing to have you hold over me the uh, the the terms of that non-disclosure agreement, yeah. um, and of course that's a choice an individual has to make. But many of the non-disclosure agreements come with uh, a lot of things in it that you will lose, making it very difficult to make that stand. Um, yeah. You know, as as a professor, uh, if you see wrongdoing or see issues that would be a misappropriation of funds or or heretical teaching, I mean. Uh, you know, wh how do you address that uh, in the real time, but then when it comes to an individual leaving and the non-disclosure agreements? Well, when I, when I was the interim president, uh, I scrutinized, and this may come under your question on accountability, but I scrutinized every adjunct and new professor, and I read everything about them, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and I was the one that held people accountable, okay? Having been the dean of students also for three years, 
and dealing with all kinds of sensitive issues. I, I know there's always two sides. Sure. And and I know the presidents of Southern and Southeast and South. Well, I know them all except I don't know Jamie Dew very well because he's new and I I've only met him maybe once. But the others I know pretty well. And uh, I believe they are trying to do the right thing. Now, when it becomes your own personal career and your money and everything as an individual professor, you may disagree with the administration, and that's what the trustees are for. Well, let's take a turn, uh, jump on a, a different subject. Uh, several months ago, a NAM whistleblower reporting website was published. Have you seen that website, and uh, what do you think about it? No, I've not seen it. Okay. Do you think uh, that ought to be something where there is a, uh, a way for individuals to be able to report issues of concern uh, to our entities? So is it a, you'll have to educate me on this, Bobby. So is this website run by NAM or is it an independent website? No, it's, it's independently run. Yeah. Where people can uh, contribute. They can sign up to get, I think they've done a couple of emails that I've received. Uh, and so you can get those emails and sign up on the website for that. Uh, and you can leave a, a report in various ways, uh, if I remember right. So, Well, when I was an Air Force officer, my, my last year and a half, I was in Las Vegas. And so one of my duties was I was the inspector general for my 400-man squadron. And so the military has this, whereby there's an officer that's in charge of reporting their complaints either to the commander who's usually a colonel or the base or wing commander who's usually a general. Um, as you might expect, uh, people are a little bit suspect that uh, a captain like myself <laughs> could actually convince a colonel or a general that their complaint was justified. Uh, I think that something like this would be better inside the organization uh, I don't know. I don't think the IMB has anything like that. Um, and, and I don't know that any of our entities do. Um, I, I do know, though, that uh, Jerry Rankin, uh, when I was uh, one of his uh, regional directors, that he had an open door policy and anybody in the organization could go in. And his open door policy was really real. You know, some people have an open door policy, but they really don't. Um, so, so I, I would just say that uh, I know that people think that the trustees of these entities don't really care, but these trustees are serving without pay, and they're coming from, they're, they're laymen, they're pastors, big churches, small churches, and it's been my experience that if they start hearing a lot, that they, they do... Um, talk to the administration and try to, in a amiable way, get things changed. If something like that were to be done, set up through the executive committee for all the entities or each entity, well, like corporations, you know, big corporations do the same thing with an independent agency that runs it, but it's all the reports go inside. So something like that, you might be supportive of if they had something of that sort. Am I hearing you right? No, well, yes and no. I, I don't think the EC should do that because oh, okay. each entity uh, is independent of the EC. Well, and actually, yeah, yeah, you're probably right because the EC's mission and their uh, obligations are a little bit different than yeah. that. That's why the trustees are there and that kind of thing. Right. I got you. Right. Well, that's a perfect transition kind of into the direction I wanted to go relative to trustees and their responding to concerns and needs. And, and that is, I'd like to ask you to comment on the current lawsuit between the North American Mission Board and Will McRaney over the torturous interference. Uh, that's been going on now over five years, I believe. And there have been many appeals by both Will McRaney, according to his testimony and the written documents he's provided, uh, and others on his behalf to the trustee board. Uh, and there's been basically no response back uh, about the allegations that have been made. There's been not, no speaking to that other than uh, kind of a generic, well, we support our leadership. Uh, what, what can you tell us? What is your insight about uh, this whole uh, thing that's been going on now for five years yeah. for torturous interference with a, a state convention or the individual who is the executive director of the state convention. Yeah. So uh, here again, I didn't know much about it. So when, when I 
listened to the other two recordings. Uh, I Googled it, and t- took a look. I'm not sure. I still understand. Maybe you can explain what the egregious offense is from your perspective. Then I'll respond to it. It is back at uh, the Mississippi North District Court, I think is what it is now. And uh, our understanding is it's moving forward now toward having depositions, uh, document, uh, you know, examinations and all that kind of stuff. So it is moving forward. Um, But I tell you what, since you're not very well versed on that, you may want to be versed. If you'd like to write something after you look at it more, we'll be glad to publish it in our group for folks to be able to look at it and see it a little bit more. Um, Let me just ask you about what I just mentioned. Uh, A lot of people are really concerned uh, that the ERLC made those statements, that the North American Mission Board made those kinds of statements, uh, misleading statements to the highest court in the land. Uh, How do you feel about our entities doing things like that that are so out of line with what our basic SBC documents, our basic bylaws, our business financial plan, all those things, when when they stray outside of that, and then there's little accountability. At this point, there's been virtually none toward NAM other than people, you know, calling it out. Uh, but I mean, everybody's still in place that I'm, I'm aware of, and there's been no no consequence at all at this point. Yeah. Well, I would just say there's you know, a difference of opinion. Uh, I did read a couple of the articles about the argument on the separation of church and state and all of that. Um, I think some would say that NAM and the RLC uh, were acting in good faith. It's obvious that some other people think that they are not, but it is something for that entity to, to address. Now, people like you and, the, and, and others can call attention to it and pressure those trustees, and, and maybe they would see it your way, but uh, I don't have enough information to say it was uh, wrong. Okay, very good. Well, let's move on. Um, at last June's annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, both the NAM president and the trustee chairman publicly responded to a messenger's request for salary structures. Now, uh, according to his testimony on the floor of the convention, he had tried to get this information multiple times privately, and he was told by the North American Mission Board, uh, you're not getting anything else from us. If you want something more, you just need to go to the floor of the convention. So he did. uh, And my understanding from a couple of weeks ago from that messenger Uh, He has said that he has yet to be provided that information, although Kevin Ezell did have a conversation with him. I'm told I wasn't in the middle of it, but uh, he had a conversation with him and told him that a third party had looked at what was being done and they had approved it. So he didn't need to worry about it anymore. Now, our documents for the, the governing documents of the SBC say that our entities are to provide that information. This is our cooperative program mission money coming from all of our near 50,000 churches. So how could you advocate to bring entities or encourage entities or push entities to be in compliance with our SBC's governing documents and their own entity rules oftentimes? So uh, exactly what documents are you referring to that say that uh, the president of an entity's salary has to be published? Well, it says the salary structures uh, for each of those positions, and that is in the bylaws. I'll have to look it up. Uh, I have looked at it before, but we can drop that in the comments of the video description once we look it up, but I'll be glad to find that. But that is in the documents that that is to be provided. Yeah. Well, one of the things that surprised me when I became interim president of Midwestern was that um, I actually got to know what the salary was for the president of Midwestern Seminary. And uh, I'm not told anyone, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, but um, what we had done at Midwestern anyway, at least, there's a range for different positions. Right. So 
I, I made $75,000 a year as, as a professor. Okay. That's about, about the top range. So we're not overpaid. <laughs> right. No, no, uh, that'd, that'd be agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the president, the salary of the uh, six seminary presidents, uh, ERLC, you know, what uh, Ronnie Floyd's salary was, I don't even know. Mm -hmm. uh, it is kind of sensitive because uh, as a professor, uh, certainly the president of Midwestern reserves, of, uh, you know, many times more than I made because of all the headaches sure. he has to put up with. Okay. And I think, and I think most people understand that, but yeah. what is, what is requested is not, I need to know the exact dollar amount for every person, but what, what is the salary structure? In other words, what is the highest amount? What is the lowest amount? Uh, where the, the variance is in there for the president, for the vice presidents and so forth. And that's, what's being uh, retained. So, you know, the question is how can you advocate that they do what basically our, our entity documents and our convention documents ask them to do. Yeah. So uh, this all uh, can be determined by hermeneutics. Some people would interpret the salary structure would be a range. Some want to know the exact dollar amount. Um, and um, probably a range would be a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. to to publish I, I don't know that uh, but I think that's up to the individual entity I don't know that the EC or the SBC governing documents can tell one of our entities yeah I'll, uh, I'll send you the reference to that because it is in there all right let's move on um, you know around 8,000 churches have left the SBC since 2007. Now, there's always some dropout. There's always churches that close, but right. many of those churches have actually reported or said to other local churches that they are leaving over the corruption or the lack of financial integrity or accountability. Southern Baptists receive very little financial information from our entities, including this request that I just mentioned from a messenger and right. others that have said that they have requested the same information. Yeah. Uh, it, it calls into question how the quarter program dollars are being used. And I think that's why people are, are kind of getting up in arms a little bit over some of these kinds of things, because they're questioning the financial integrity of some of our entities. So do you think that each of our entities should basically undergo a periodic uh, forensic audit periodically just to make sure that our mission dollars are being well spent and we can assure all yeah. of those who are givers to the cooperative program of that? Well, I think I'm a good person to answer this question. So I'm certainly uh, the only candidate who's been the CFO of an entity. <laughs> so yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> I, I, went, I went to the CFO retreat of all the entities. They actually have a retreat for the CFOs of all the entities. And I thought to myself, I never thought I would be in this group. But uh, you, you'll also, uh, I don't know, Jason, I don't listen to this, but he told me one time, he said, now, in a few months, I'm going to get a real CFO. <laughs> what so, what and, a hit. Yeah, that, that's and, kind and, of a, I, a, yeah, a low blow. Yeah. But I didn't dispute that because I never uh, fancied myself as a real CFO. Right. You weren't planning on staying there. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't. But when I inherited the interim presidency and then became the interim CFO, uh, we were, I, I had to go to the executive committee and explain why we had very little reserves. And I, I went, uh, we had a private auditor. Uh, he was, it was a Jewish firm. And, and they did one of these forensic audits uh, because we, that was something that was, that, that we needed at the time. I also learned that there's not really a such thing as a forensic audit that there's an audit and then it's kind of a moving scale because in an audit, you just pick random receipts to look at. And then as the, as the urgency is more uh, pressing, you can make it, but I don't think even forensic audit looks at every single receipt. Okay. But I know this, that uh, at least the entity that I work for uh, are very, 
judicious on how they handle uh, the expenditures of the cooperative program. As an adjunct coming to Midwestern to teach, uh, the per diem is $30 a day to eat. Now, nobody can eat on $30 a day anymore. And um, I know that uh, when the IMB had this meeting, all the professors had to share a room. That's not sharing a room with their wives, but two professors in a room. And so I believe by and large that our entities really see the cooperative program money as something to be stewarded, okay? Now, the, there may be anecdotal stories about, uh, you know, waste here and there, uh, but, but I do know that, uh, you know, our, our provost looks at every receipt. I actually looked at many receipts. I signed every check at Midwestern for a year and a half, okay? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I can just state that we, and I don't think we were any different than the other entities in making sure our cooperative program. Uh, so I think that the audits that we have now are sufficient. I'll give you, that's my short answer. Okay. Um, many SBC leaders have been accused of not being that transparent, particularly when it comes to the financial issues. Uh, just kind of like, you know, we were talking about the issue yeah. with the North American Mission Board, but that's not the only place. In fact, when uh, it was revealed that the trustee chairman, Jimmy Scroggins at Lifeway had cut a million dollar check to Tom Rayner when he was leaving and retiring. Well, he was retiring from Lifeway going to another full-time uh, job, but uh, he gave him a million dollar out the door uh, gift without trustee board approval, without their compensation committee's approval. Um, I mean, he cut it by himself and yet nothing was ever said. And it only came to light later when someone discovered that and revealed that. And yeah. then ultimately, I believe Rainer returned the money and there was a lot of stuff happened with that. But the transparency up front and the, the lack of accountability is what has continued to concern people uh, about various situations. Now you call it antidotal, but it seems like there are a number of things that have been put out there uh, for where, where people have said that there it's evidence at that point. So as the next president, do you think you can play a role helping Southern Baptists to get answers from these Southern Baptist leaders when things like that million dollar gift were, were given without anything being said until it was revealed later or some other things that may come into play? Yeah, yeah I think that the Southern Matters president, he, he sits on what's called the Great Commission Council. So the Great Commission Council is the SBC president. So uh, when I was at Midwestern in these roles, I attended every EC meeting for five years. So um, I have experience, I kind of know how EC works and more importantly, how it doesn't work. Um, and I, I think that as the president sits around with the entity heads, who most of them I know, um, and, and I think all of them really want to do the right thing. Um, I think we, we have to be encouraged and uh, to, we can always do better. All right. So I don't know anything about this situation with, um, uh, Tom Rayner. Uh, I, I do know that he, um, when we were looking for a president, uh, he, he met with our search committee. I was part of that search committee in the beginning stages. He helped us a lot. Um, I think a lot of him. And um, I, I wouldn't want to second guess what happened without knowing the other side of the story. All right. Well, let's let's don't delve any more into that then. Um, we do need to keep moving and uh, sure. remind you again to try to be as concise as possible. Uh, let's ask you for a second to describe your call to the task of SBC president. Tell us what separates you from these other nominees and what what do you feel is your call to this? <laughs> so um, obviously my experience as an IMB missionary so I tell people I'm the only candidate who can feel dress a wildebeest. Uh, I had to that is, hunt. That is probably quite accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I had to hunt and my own meat for the table in, in Tanzania because there wasn't any meat. And I would say I wasn't very good at it. 
I'd only shot a squirrel before I went to Tanzania and I had to shoot these big animals and learn how to skin them. Uh, so what I tried to say in my book, I'm a practical missiologist church planner, but because of a hand, having a handicapped child, it forced me into academia where I had to, um, you know, get a, uh, THD. Uh, I already had a D-min when I started and I, and I had to become a, a seminary professor. Um, and so I, I have experience in two boards, seminary, that is Midwestern Seminary, uh, IMB for 18 years. I was in the high administration of the IMB. Um, and when I uh, retired from residential teaching, moved out to California, um, and Ed Litton decided not to run for a second term. I thought I could offer my wisdom and my experience, as I'm sure the oldest candidate, uh, and, and just help Southern Baptists to realize kind of where we've come from. I was in the uh, pew at Bellevue Baptist Church when Adrian Rogers was elected president the first time. And off from one side, a deranged man came and tried to tackle him at the pulpit on live TV at Bellevue Baptist Church on Sunday morning in Memphis, Tennessee. And I believe that that was Satan's attempt to stop the great conservative resurgence. And I watched as the convention moved from neo-orthodoxy or in some of our seminaries, liberal liberalism, to where all the professors, now we may, uh, as a pastor friend of mine in California used to say, there's always foxes in the vineyard and you have to worry about a few things that may come up here and there, but all of our professors are, we have the best seminaries and so I just want to be able to tell uh, Southern Baptist to remember the mission. And that is, we were founded, we only exist two days a year, to support our NAM and IMB missionaries. All these other entities, including the seminaries, were added later. But that's really why we're together as Southern Baptist. And that I would like to return some of the joy of being a Southern Baptist to the SBC. Because we've been short on joy. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, have you been monitoring uh, the online debates about the various SBC issues that have kind of been flaring up over the past 12 months? Yes. Although I say I've only joined Twitter and Facebook two weeks ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I have been following the debates. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and many of those online debates obviously have been a pretty heated over past time. Now, um, the next section uh, of topics are, are really about many of these issues that are coming up. So we could spend a lot of time on each of them, but we don't have that much time on them. But I, I would like to ask you about these just as we have the other candidates sure. uh, to kind of get your perspective on them as well at that point. Um, let's start with the issue of abuse. This has been an area that has been much debated and used. And uh, uh, let me give you a quote that an SBC pastor posted on Facebook, and then I wanna get your response to it. An SBC pastor wrote this. He said, weaponizing abuse victims to achieve a hidden agenda is itself a form of abuse. Do you agree or disagree with that? Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. I think it seemed like both of the other guys said that. I mean, I, I think, but if you now, say, are, that, are you agreeing because they agreed with it, or are you just no, saying? no? Well, okay. I think their answers are good. What I would okay. say is that is that if you say that though, you don't want to minimize someone's suffering. Oh no, no, no! I don't think that was the intent yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah, well, I got you. But but sometimes when people say something like that, they're kind of minimizing. There's the potential of minimizing some real suffering that's going on. Okay. Well, and. And I don't know what instigated that comment from this particular pastor. Uh, yeah. It was in a thread uh, on Facebook or Twitter. I don't remember where I found it first when it, it popped up. But uh, I, I know part of that idea was there have been many accusations about uh, the weaponization of those victims at our annual meeting last year, uh, you know, trying to put them under the spotlight and trying to highlight 
things that were going on, even the accusations that were made uh, against Pastor Mike when he was running. Uh, and many of them felt like they were they were weaponizing the victims to try to make a point. And uh, that's why uh, I think this pastor, whether it be about that specifically or something else, uh, that was kind of the impression I got, the weaponizing of a victim. So uh, let me ask you this, then. What, what do you think we can do to address what has been going on, at least in better than the last 12 months, where victims have been uh, uh, used as weapons to some extent against others? Well, as uh, as dean of students and then as a regional leader with IMB, I had to personally investigate different cases, some down overseas, some obviously at the school. And, and I and I know always there's two sides to every story. And if you just listen to one side, you're going to get a slanted view. Uh, and I also learned that each one's unique and has special circumstances. Um, I, I think that I would use my wisdom and experience to try to bring people together. Um, and, and we have this, I, I was thinking maybe this report might come out even today. Uh, we don't know when this, uh, t this task force is. Oh, going. the, yeah. The sexual abuse task force. Yeah. Report. yeah. yeah so, it's, I mean, it's due to come out part. soon. Yeah. Yeah. We're holding our breath as to what that might be. So I think we have to see what that is. Um, and, and certainly we should, no one should weaponize anything against anybody. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, in the past few weeks, the SBC internet really has exploded with the, what's being called buck gate, yeah, uh, right. without detailing the entire story. What's your response to the accusations that SBC elites have, uh, conspired to blackmail Texas pastor Tom Buck and his wife Jennifer Buck over the un unauthorized sharing of an article draft on the subject of abuse that she was working on and had sent a draft uh, to, to be reviewed and had not been published, but it apparently had been shared and then was weaponized against him. How, how do you respond to that kind of thing? Well, I, I have followed that, and after reading all the Twitter on both sides, I, I, I'm just, I'm still not sure I understand it all <laughs> because uh, you have people saying this, saying that, and saying I wasn't involved, I was involved. I just feel sorry for uh, Brother Buck. I feel sorry for Willie Rice. Um, you know, you can't, in, in a large organization, you can't, uh, you have to um, take responsibility sometimes for things that uh, you, you weren't really um, totally your fault. Um, I've seen the response that was, was on Twitter about uh, the response from the, the people who some have said released uh, that information. And I, th I think as someone on the outside, I can't really say who is at fault. I really can't. But I feel sorry for Brother Buck. Um, it seems like he's a sincere guy. And, uh, yeah, well, and uh, if folks want to know more about that story, they're not familiar with it, you can, as you said, search that, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, just uh, a Google search uh, using Buckgate or uh, their names will bring that up. Uh, we will put a link down here in the description, the video description to the Buck's response. They right. uh, did a response. I don't, uh, it was 13, 14, 15 minutes. It wasn't real long. Yeah. Uh, but where they tried to, as they said, take back their story uh, at that point. And there have been numerous articles and uh, video reports and other things that have been done on the topic. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's out there. Uh, you know, the, the concern that many are, are uh, chiming in about is, again, it looks like somebody's situation, a very personal situation, was used as a weapon against them. Now, since Southern Baptists have clearly stated their intolerance for clergy sexual abuse, what do you see as the next steps and how can you help as president? Some of that I understand may be contingent upon this report when it comes out, but we don't have that report right now. So what do you see as next steps? Well, it's the executive committee. Uh, so, so the messengers voted um, that this investigation take place, that outside uh, group would investigate, and then uh, Ed Litton appointed a task force. And uh, so they'll give their report, and a lot of what 
the next president will do will be to implement that with EC. And now the president is just an EC member. And as we have seen, the EC doesn't always take the SBC president's advice. He gets to preach at the EC meetings, the two meetings, uh, but he can't direct the EC to do anything. Um, I would like to see what the recommendations are and um, then it would fall on my plate to implement what they are. And the messengers have to vote to accept the rec recommendations too. Right, sure. Which we don't sure. know. They could, they could vote to, to um, receive some of them, but not all of them. I don't know what, what will be there. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, and we don't, we don't know that until we get the actual report. Right. Well, some of this relative to these things we've been talking about with abuse kind of play into uh, the, the new political climate that the SBC has. Now, I say new. Uh, there have been politics behind the scene for decades and decades, I know, um, uh, and that's kind of what happened during the conservative resurgence and a lot of other things, so we found out, but the, the politics and the campaigns behind the scene uh, have been very pointed of recent years. Uh, how do you respond to those who are now seemingly orchestrating campaigns to discredit the other presidential nominees? just like yeah. happened with uh, the discrediting of Willie Rice you just mentioned. Right, right. Well, my, my advantage, I, I, I say I'm like the 15th seed in the NCAA tournament. See, nobody, <laughs> nobody's much uh, worried about me. Uh, so I don't think anybody's trying to discredit me. Maybe they have, other than saying uh, they don't know me. Um, I haven't seen them trying to dis. well, I guess, I guess you could say it's kind of... Uh, Maybe some are doing backhanded discrediting. Um, so I, I don't think that's good. Uh, well, the, the, the attack on Jennifer Buck was far right. from backhanded. That was well, yeah, very that pointed uh, and yeah. But that wasn't against a particular candidate, that was against them, I, I guess. And, and I would just say on, on SBC elites, I know some of these guys, I knew them before they were. Well, let, let, okay, let, let me interrupt you a second. You said that wasn't really against them. Uh, I, I mean, it was against Buck and Jennifer, but yeah. if I understand, and I may be totally wrong, but if I understand what ended up happening, uh, Tom Buck and his two uh, deacons or elders went privately to right. Willie Rice because there was a connection for this individual who there was a sexual abuse situation. Uh, Tom had connection with him from a previous church is yeah, how he knew right. about it. Yeah, and so they went, yeah, they went privately right. to talk to him, but then that was all revealed later and made public. Therefore, Willie felt like he had to resign. And he, of course, he made a public statement and then that was jumped on. And so, uh, I mean, it was kind of around your elbow to get to your thumb, I guess, in that sense where the attack came to hit Jennifer and Tom but it was really trying to take down Willie, it seems like at that point. Maybe I'm wrong. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just seem like Willie Rice is a nice guy. Seem like the Bucks are nice guys. And uh, I do know that some of the people who were supposed to or have orchestrated that uh, denied that they had any uh, part in it. So it's hard to know, really. Yeah. But uh, well, let me ask you this then. What what do these types of hit campaigns tell you about the spiritual state of our convention? Yeah. Well, I, I think we do need a revival. And I do know, I know there's a lot of people that uh, that's why I'm trying to focus on, on missions. Uh, because I think there's a lot of folks that say, okay, I mean, being an SBC president, uh, there's no pay, there's no power. It's basically an honorary position, except for the Committee on Committees. You know, we had some conservative presidents. I knew Kay Owen White. Kay Owen White wrote Death in the Pot. Okay, that was back in 63. <laughs> Got the first Baptist faith message. And then and, and then W.A. Criswell was also president, but no one had the idea until the patterson Pressler guy uh, coalition said, hey, we need to string this together and we can make some changes. So we've had some conservative presidents, uh, but it, so th things have, uh, have been implemented um, and, and you could say, well, that was political, but it needed to be done. 
that is having a, a more conservative convention. But now we're to the point, I think that most people would say we're in a conservative place and we need to just, we need to focus on missions, evangelism, church planning, and all that goes along with that. But I know that's hard to do when you, you feel like you're being attacked. You know, it's easy to say, yeah, let's do missions. But if you feel like you're being attacked and you're the aggrieved party, you have some other concerns, it's hard not to respond to those. Right. And of course, we've had things that have not just been attacked from within. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I mean, we did a very, it was a small poll, but we did a small poll on Twitter about how many people participate and are active on Twitter and found out that only 2% of the respondents spent 45 minutes or more on Twitter every day. Yeah, so, so it wasn't like there was a lot of people involved in that uh, yeah. as far as the online. But uh, a lot of these issues, if they were brought before a local church, many of the people in the local church would obviously be concerned. And national media have picked up on some of these. Obviously, the Sermon Gate uh, thing that happened with Ed Litton, all the things between he and J.D. Greer, several things uh, have hit big news uh, in the sense of national publications that were not just religious publications. One of those topics is really the issue of critical race theory. Uh, over the past years, there have been reports of multiple professors that have been using critical race theory in their classrooms at our seminaries. What, what is your view of that? What, what are you aware of? Um, critical race theory is a theory like the theory of evolution. It's another theory I don't believe in. I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in critical race theory. Um, you know, race is not a biblical term. It's never in the scripture either the Greek or the English, um, what the scripture uses is the term ethnos, ethnos. Mm -hmm. And really there's only two as Jews and Gentiles. We Gentiles have been grafted in because of God's great grace. And so I grew up in the era of the separate water fountains, the separate restrooms, separate hotels, there was no place more segregated than Tallahassee, Florida in the 50s and 60s where I grew up. Then I went to Africa as a missionary, and I'd say the finest Christians on earth are the African Christians. I'm also probably the only one uh, among many who I had a black pastor, African pastor, for 12 years because I lived in Africa, and I belonged to a local church. My That's kids true. grew up in a black church where I we were uh, in the minority, we were the one half of 1%. Everybody else was African. Okay? So I've had it in the reverse. So critical race theory is something that's really just in America. Now, uh, I have, I'm in the process of reading Bodhi's book. And, and he said that there's say, a- Say that again. What, what book was I, it? I'm in the I process it. of reading Bodhi Bochum's book. Oh, I got you, Bodhi Bochum. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I'm learning some things because he's in Zambia, and I, and I didn't work in Zambia, but I've been to Zambia twice. Uh, I, there are some issues on Marxism and colonialism that are in Africa that we don't have here. Uh, Africans deal with tribalism. Uh, we, we deal with racism. And as we define racism in America, I believe there is racism. But um, I try to be a force to combat that, both as a teenage boy, as a college student, and then as a missionary overseas. Okay, and, so uh, let, let me go back to my question. What, what sure. is your position then on critical race theory being used in our seminaries and why? I have not, it's certainly not being used at Midwestern. And, okay. and, and I, uh, I teach worldviews, I teach world religions. So if anyone was teaching it, I would probably, I, I think I would know it. Uh, the, the person I co-teach with does teach about Marxism, but he teaches a, a, about it negatively. He, you know, he says Marxism is, is bad. So, Well, there, there's one thing in an educational institution 
uh, you want to be challenged. Like I remember one of my ethics professors when I was at Southwestern, a lot of people would get really up in arms, but I would sit and just laugh sometimes because I knew what he was doing. He would throw something out that was just insane. Uh, I knew that he agreed with the Baptist faith and message to be a professor at Southwestern. And uh, he would throw something out that would be so opposed to that. Uh, and boy, the students would just light up. I mean, they'd be into each other and fighting back and forth. And he would just sit back with his arms crossed smiling because he knew what he'd done. But he was trying to help us to be critical thinkers and and to 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 argue our position to right. to be apologists basically and uh usually uh, a lot of, a lot of times it wasn't at the end of the day he wanted us to mull over it but uh, a day or two or a week or two later he'd come back and say now let's really talk about this again and right. uh help you to see it but that's part of the educational process and i personally i'm i'm comfortable with that but i'm not comfortable with uh cw uh, or crt uh, and the, those approaches being used uh, as a teaching mechanism. Well, right. we're, we're almost at the end of time, and we have one more major subject that we've dealt with and I want to talk to you about. Uh, many have observed multiple trustee system failures over recent years uh, in our entities, and we addressed some about the trustees earlier, but do you see a need of reform in our trustee system? Well, um, I know you mentioned trustee training uh, earlier. Is that what you're right. talking about? Well, it could be. Yeah, if, if you're supportive of that. And how do you see that? I mean, if you see there's a need for reform, what does that look like? Well, so I did the trustee training for our new trustees at Midwestern. So I, I think I know something about that. I had someone from the executive committee. I can't remember which guy it was, who was kind of an expert on trustee training. So he would come and help me with that. And then I did the, the local part and he would do the national part. Um, I think it's always, you can never have enough training, whatever field you're in. Uh, and a lot of these trustees, they'll come on different boards. And there's so, we have so many boards and agencies and entities. Um, and and they, may not, they may not know exactly what all they're supposed to do. And I know that, some think that when the entity itself does trustee training, that perhaps it's a little self-serving, that they're telling them, okay, don't meddle with us, you know, and you're just there to say amen. Uh, I think most trustees know that uh, if, if they smell something, then they need to investigate, okay? Uh, they probably might need to be told that. Um, now, I don't know how to implement that. You know, we spend enough money as it is. I don't think we need to bring everybody to the uh, SBC uh, because the new trustees, they don't know they're going to be voted in exactly. And maybe they're on the list to join a new entity and, you know, maybe something would happen. They can't join that entity. Right. You well, know, the, the logistics would have to all be worked out. Yeah, I think really what we're looking for is your support of that. If you'd advocate for an independent uh, kind of a training program for those entity trustees to have completed before they actually serve. Yeah, probably the best way to do it, having done trustee training myself, usually what happens is when you have a trustee board meeting, you bring in your new trustees two days early and they do their orientation. And then, um, then the regular board meeting takes place. I think the best way to bring in a in an independent trustee trainer so you wouldn't be flying trustees all over the United States. I got it. So you're, you're thinking uh, each entity would still have uh, some of their own training that's uh, obviously uh, focused on their entity and what they do specifically, but yeah. you would have an independent trustee trainer where there would be an agreed upon training process that would help them understand their fiduciary responsibility, their policy enforcement, leadership oversight, those kinds of things. Yeah. And that individual would come in and that would be basically the same presentation done for each of the entity boards by yeah. that outside uh, trainer as such. Yeah. Is that and EC has offered that. I'm just one of the few that took them up on it. And I brought okay. the EC guy in and I just let him say what he wanted. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I think, I think, the, the thought that I have heard is outside Southern Baptist. When we talk about independent, not an EC person, not an entity leader from another entity, not even a local Southern Baptist pastor, somebody who 
who specializes in this kind of training. And there are lots of groups because there's so many nonprofits. Uh, yeah, I, you know. I think we would want them to know something about the SBC. Well, sure. Yeah. yeah. But but the reality is the, the legal requirements of, of trustees for a nonprofit board, that has nothing to do with being SBC. That has to do with the legal requirements. So I think that's probably more what the concern would be uh, yeah. at that point. Well, yeah. let me wrap up uh, these questions with this. Uh, one of the, the big things that the president does, he has very limited power other than a platform and some influence, but he does make appointments to committee on committees, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And he's asked to do that in the case of this last year, he was asked to appoint a, a task force for the abuse task yep. force. Um, how would you determine who you appoint to serve in the various places that you would be responsible for appointments? Yeah. So my wife served on the committee on committees in 1989. She was a Jerry Vines appointee. And as, as I've said earlier, I, I, I was a, a member of the resolutions committee. Uh, I was appointed by Bobby Welch. And the next year I was a carryover from Frank Page. Um, I know a lot of people around the SBC. I know I know people from what some would consider both sides, uh, cons uh, the Conservative Baptist Network. I know some guys and the founders. I, I know people that would be more associated with um, some of the other groups. I think I have an advantage in that uh, just my wife and I and my nominator, Wade Aikens, we decided I would run. So I'm not part of any group. Um, so, so I would seek counsel from people that I respect and any Southern Baptist or entity head or um, state convention president or executive director or associational leader. Some of our best guys come from our associations. Um, the chairman of EC, Roland Slade, is from my local association. I met him at an associational meeting when I first moved to San Diego County. So, so I would, um, but I know there's some good lay people out there too that, that uh, are knowledgeable. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's what I'd say. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, uh, Robin, we are so glad to have you uh, join us tonight. I want us to wrap up tonight by giving you kind of the opportunity to share with us uh, whatever you would like to say to Southern Baptist, uh, what, what would be your, your message? What would be your vision that you would like to share with all Southern Baptists as we wrap up tonight? Yeah. I would like Southern Baptist to re remember our mission. And our mission is to send missionaries here in North America and overseas. Um, when the Judsons went to well, first they went to India and then to Burma in 1812. Uh, they went as congregational missionaries. And then uh, on the way over on the boat, they discovered they were Baptist. And they had no support. And so it was an emergency. And the Baptist denomination started just to support some missionaries that were already on the field but had no money. And Southern Baptists, we are part of that line of missions. You know, that group has split numerous times, but we Southern Baptists, I believe, carry the torch for overseas missions. The IMB was just in about, or the old foreign mission board was just in about 20 countries. It wasn't until after World War II that God bless Southern Baptist, what was it a million and million more in 54 or something like that. Yeah, no, um, I remember my dad talking about <laughs> a million more in 54. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what happened is it, it sent missionaries all over the world because of that. Uh, Southern Baptists used to mainly work among the Native American tribes uh, in the old home mission board. And then we started planning churches throughout the United States. We used to have the old comedy agreements. That's comedy spelled with an I, not an E. And those agreements said we would stay out of the West and the Northeast. And, but we realized that the other Baptist denominations didn't have the same vision we did. So we started sending people all over the United States, especially Alaska, where I was called to, to missions. And so I would just want Southern Baptists to be able to um, focus. 
And I don't mean that the past presidents haven't done that. I'm not going to criticize anybody, really. But my candidacy, um, or when my name is put into nomination, as I think it will be, uh, I just want us to remember the mission that God has called us to. And I'd like to see our WMU revitalized because our kids are not learning about missions. Uh, we don't emphasize GAs and RAs. So. The WMU is what got us through our first couple of terms. We lost a child. That child's a period in Nairobi. It was the WMU ladies that prayed for us. Mm -hmm. um, and they were the ones that made sure that, I, that the Foreign Mission Board still sent missionaries during the Great Depression. And so, so I, I just look upon, upon that legacy and believe that uh, with my experience, wisdom, and I guess age too, that I could call Southern Baptist back to uh, remembering their mission. All right, well, Dr. Robin Hadaway, we are so glad to have you joining us tonight. And we appreciate you taking the time out to be a part of this uh, Facebook Live uh, for our group. Thank you.